Biden's student loan forgiveness plan makes the poor pay for the rich. And so he has another plan out there to try to forgive some of the student loans that are out there. And that's not going to help replenish the market, make college more affordable or anything like that. It's actually going to make the situation worse. And it's going to pass along that cost in the form of higher taxes, inflation and debt for not only today with higher interest rates, but also for the future, for, for, for Americans that are looking to build their career and everything else. That's not a good situation at all. Hello, welcome to this week's Economy. I'm your host, Dr. Vance Gann. Thank you for joining me again today. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today as we're ending another week on this week's Economy. And it's really a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for, for joining me. Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, post, do all the things that you do. It would be much appreciated. Remember that you can find all of my information at vanceskin.com. You can also go on to Substack or where it's vanceskin.substack.com and find all my daily tweets or posts on x.com, formerly known as Twitter. That's where you can find all the information. So let's get right into it. The previous LPP episode, the Let People Prosper episode, was with Texas State Representative Brian Harris. Harrison on his time as chief of staff at Health and Human Services in D.C. during the COVID situation, time in the Situation Room, and the need to eliminate property taxes and pass universal school choice in Texas. He's been on the front lines of that. You don't want to miss that episode. Also this week, on Wednesday, there was a bonus episode with Adam Meister on This Week in Bitcoin. I've been on that, on that podcast a few times now. Please go check them out and be sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss it. It was a good discussion. I talked about you know, a lot of big things that are going on in the economy and and try to give a good view on that. So be sure to check that out. The upcoming Let People Prosper episode is going to be with former U.S. Senator Phil Graham, who's a Republican out of Texas, on his book, The Myth of American Inequality, his time in Congress, and much more. He's truly a delight. You don't want to miss it. We talk about a lot of key things, so please check that one out. And then on next Wednesday, I'm going to have another bonus episode of my episode on the Human Reaction Podcast. Great podcast out of Montana. We talked a lot about free market reforms, my journey as an economist, and so forth. Don't miss that that as well. So without further ado, though, let's get right to what's going on in, in the news. It's a lot of stuff happening. You know, over the last week, uh, this week, we've had the new speaker, Mike Johnson, a Republican out of Louisiana, the Shreveport area. You know, he, from what I understand, he's been, he's a, a top-notch guy, good-hearted, just good person, and has good policy chops as well. That's what we need in that speaker position. He notes key free market reforms and economic principles on his website. And so that's also good to note. And uh, for my friends, the Pelican Institute out of Louisiana, they say that they know him really well. He's also a champion of school choice, tax reform, and other things, and spending restraints. So we'll see. We need that up there. So hopefully that is the case. When you look at some of the economic news, though, it's quite interesting. We had gross domestic product, the measure of economic output across the United States, and inflation adjusted terms, which you call real GDP. It increased by 4.9% in the third quarter of 2023 on an annualized basis to $22.5 trillion. So that's the size of our economy. If you exclude out the price it, um, changes over time, this is the fastest rate that 4.9% since this 7% rate of the Q4 of 2021. So we're talking about nearly you know two years and since we've seen this rate. This is a rapid rate. It was much higher than some anticipated. If you look at the St. Louis Fed's GDP now cast, they had it closer to about 2%, whereas the Atlanta Fed's GDP now, there's are two estimates of how they um, look at the forecast, different economic indicators that are coming out. They had a little over 5%. So this was closer to the Atlanta Fed's GDP now estimate than the St. Louis Fed's now cast. And that's something we want to watch moving forward. But, you know, if you look at some of the other measures that are actually not increasing economic growth, but are actually an impediment to economic growth, like government spending, which added 0.8% percentage points to that 4.9% rate, we could reduce that down to 4.1%. So not as fast as the 4.9%. And if you exclude the volatile inventory purchases by businesses, whether they are trying to re um, replenish them or they're trying to spend more before interest rates go up and it continue to go up anyway. And, and so we'll see if this continues, but inventory was at 1.3 percentage points of that 4.9. So you subtract out government spending, you subtract out that volatile measure of inventory purchases, and it's down to 2.8% of GDP uh, growth in the Q3 2020. 
three. So that's something else that shows that there are some weaknesses that are still out there. If you look at the GDP implicit price deflator, which is the measure of inflation for the economy, was up 3.5% in that third quarter. So that's still pretty fast. It shows why so many Americans are feeling hit hard by how the rising prices all around them. And when you add up the 4.9% and the 3.5%, that gives you nominal GDP, the price inflated measure of gross domestic product. And so it means it was up 8.4% which is, isn't su sustainable. It's another reason why I think the Federal Reserve will, should continue to cut its balance sheet even faster than what it already is, meaning that it's going to put more upward pressure on interest rates, um, and that will make it more costly to buy a home. A lot of the other car loans that are out there, as 10-year note, is up to 5%. We're going to continue to see higher interest rates, just like I've been saying for a long time, because this is not temporary or transitory inflation. It's persistent inflation, and Congress isn't getting their spending under control, and so the Fed needs to control its balance sheet, and then that will help to not only you know, deflate the economy, get all get rid of this eco um, economic price inflation and distortions throughout the marketplace. But it would also mean, you know, a steeper decline in the economy. But I get that because we've been propped up for so long. So that's what we need to look at there. I had another piece out recently in the American Institute for Economic Research called Weak Economy Provides Key Policy Lessons. I went through a lot of the stuff that I just discussed about GDP growth, inflation, the transitory versus persistent inflation that's been talked about over the last couple of years. I hope you'll go and check it out. It's a really good piece. That and I hope you'll share with your friends and family because, look, I mean, at the, I've been at the front lines of saying this was not going to be transitory inflation given the economic failures that have happened by government. And from the shutdowns, from the increase in the money supply and the balance sheet on the monetary policy side, the increases in the national debt by $7 trillion from problems by Congress and President Biden's overregulation of the economy. All this stuff contributed to some transitory issues, but it was a persistent inflation problem because of government failure. So I hope you'll check that one out. Um, I also had a piece out recently over at at the econlib.com talking about Biden's student loan forgiveness plan makes the poor pay for the rich. And so he has another plan out there to try to forgive some of the student loans that are out there. And that's not going to help replenish the market, make make college more affordable or anything like that. It's actually going to make the situation worse. And it's going to pass along that cost in the form of higher taxes, inflation, and debt for not only today with higher interest rates, but also for the future, for, for, for Americans that are looking to build their career and everything else. That's not a good situation at all. When you look at the states, um, I had a recent piece come out at Texas Fiscal Responsibility, Texas Economic Brief, shows improvements, but more policy changes are needed. There needs to be more spending restraint. There needs to be more property tax relief. There needs to be universal school choice. These are the things that are going to help Texas be set apart for the future. And instead, they're being left behind from all the other states, either nine states that are passing universal school choice. It was one of the big parts of my discussion with State Representative Brian Harrison to talk about why this is so important. And, and many people may end up fleeing the state if we don't have universal school choice in Texas because you can get more resources available at your disposal if you go somewhere else, along with having improvements in student outcomes, which is ultimately what we, we should want and having an improving economy as well. So that's something else we need to look at. And then I had another piece out published by Center Square, a commentary talking about more about Texas. They have $18.3 billion surplus proves Texas can cut property taxes more. This was released recently by the comptroller, um, Glenn Hager, saying we have $18.3 billion surplus in Texas. And while there was some minimal things done for property tax relief this year, there's more that it is needed. And unfortunately, I think a lot of it's just going to be spent on government school system instead of for students. There's, there's all these propositions for constitutional amendments to add to the Texas Constitution. 14 of them are going to be, are on the November 7th ballot. You know, earlier this week on Monday, they already started early voting. And so people are already voting on this. And, and look, my votes are going to be um, no on all of these, except for Proposition 3, which is the prohibiting, actually, a wealth tax in Texas, and um, Proposition 12, which will be abolishing the Galveston County Treasurer's Office, which he's already told me he's willing to get that up. So I think that's a, a good way to start to reducing the size and scope of government. And I think that this would be a good endeavor because all the rest of it would add up to more than 13, nearly 14 billion more dollars every biennium in new spending outside the constitutional spending limit because they're constitutionally dedicating these funds. That's not a good idea. It's going to make Texas worse off. And a lot of it's just picking winners and losers, just corporate welfare, uh, whether it's in the housing market or something else. This is not a good situation. So those mostly should be rejected. Louisiana, I also published an economic brief um, at the Pelican Institute talking about the economy there. They have a very low uh, unemployment rate of 3.3%, and the um, unemployed number is also at a record low, but they have a lot of people who have left 
Louisiana over the last couple of years. And so when you include the people who have left, the unemployment rate would be closer to 5% if they were all unemployed in the labor force. And so that's not a good sign. You also have the issue where they're saying they have all these new jobs that are being created. But if you look at the household survey that shows that they have been losing jobs in the last four months in Louisiana, that's not a good indication. And they've also been losing a lot of jobs when you look at the non-farm -pay payroll. And so when, when Governor Bell Edwards says that they've been creating jobs the last 30 months, that's just not true. And, and he's also saying, and look at the record low unemployment rate and everything, but that misses the, the forest from the trees when there's still a lot of problems that are going in Louisiana. That's why we've been working on tax reform plans, the comeback agenda, really finding ways to unleash people's opportunity to prosper across the state. So that's a big one there. And last but certainly not least, I'm going to start ending these every week with a Bible verse of the week. My Bible verse for this week is a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 11.25. There's so much truth to that. I hope that we can continue to refresh one another. That's what Christ wants us to do. And ultimately, look, I'm a Christian. This is where I come from, a lot of my worldview and everything else. And I want to make sure that we have that discussion is, um, here too. We'll have some people on talking about that. Dr. Norman Horn from the Libertarian Christian Institute will be on soon. And so we'll have some good discussions. Um, but anyway, that's what I've got for you for the news for the week. And until next time, let people prosper.